Good morning. My name is Carlos Medina, pronouns he, him, his. I am the Learning Services Manager at San Diego Grantmakers, and I welcome you to our webinar, An Impact Investing Journey to Address California's Housing Crisis. I will be starting us off today, reviewing a few housekeeping elements for today's webinar. Just um, some items to keep in mind. Number one, if you have questions, feel free to type them in throughout the webinar. You'll see where it says chat at the bottom of the screen. You can type your questions in there and we'll uh, weave them into today's conversation. Additionally, today's webinar is being recorded. So I wanted to make sure that participants are um, aware of that and you will be able to access this recording at a later time to really benefit from uh, the information and resources that are discussed today. And lastly, uh, at the end of today's webinar, during the closing remarks, we will add an evaluation poll in our chat box. And San Diego Grantmakers really appreciates your support by completing it because that valuable feedback will help us to improve future programming. So thank you now for taking a minute or two to complete the poll later. As I mentioned, we have a lot of great content and great speakers for you today. So with those details for housekeeping out of the way, I'd like to introduce San Diego Grantmakers President and CEO, Betty McKeon, who will provide some background on today's webinar. Thank you. Thank you so much, Carlos, and welcome. Welcome to each and every one of you. I'm delighted to be here today. Um, and, and I think this is such an important topic and conversation for today as we see the tremendous impacts of the pandemics in which we're in the midst of having even more impacts on California's already urgent housing crisis. So we're excited to be here to have a conversation about the innovative solutions that are underway to really help us climb, climb uh, ourselves out of this crisis uh, to really be able to assure that we have housing for all. Um, I would like to take a moment also to introduce um, uh, Mary Knorr, who's the Vice President, our Community Relations Manager for the San Diego Market with Bank of America. We're really delighted that Bank of America, as a longtime member of San Diego Grantmakers and also sponsor of today's series, uh, is here to be with us to host this conversation, make this possible. Um, as I think about it, Bank of America seemed like a natural partner for this webinar series. They've been in an impact investing since 2013. And really, when we talk about today's conversation, as I think about it, across all of their markets and their business lines, their philanthropic and their impact investments, they've been leveraging all the tools in their toolboxes to be able to be a leader in supporting solutions uh, to our housing crisis and also making home ownership affordable as a primary wealth building vehicle for individuals and families. And so with that, I'd like to say good morning, Mary, and thanks to Bank of America for supporting our conversation today. And I wonder if you'd like to welcome uh, your friends and colleagues on today's call. Absolutely, thank you so much, Debbie. I'm so honored to be here with you today and everybody. As Debbie mentioned, my name is Mary Knorr and I'm the Community Relations Manager here in San Diego. And I must tell you, I really, really love my job and enjoy it because every day I get the chance to make a positive impact in our communities. Um, access for affordable housing definitely remains a significant challenge um, in our community today. In these challenging times, as Debbie mentioned, in the past several months, it's more important than ever for everybody to be able to have a home and to feel safe. We recognize the need that there needs to be shelter in place. Recently, I'm happy to say that we supported Father Joe's um, Village's efforts, the amazing work that they did of bringing the homeless into the convention center with a $100,000 grant. So great to be part of something like that. For many, as we all know, affordable housing is becoming further and further out of reach where we've got 18 million households paying more than 50% of their income for housing. That's why we support nonprofit organizations who work to reserve and preserve and increase access for a mix of ways for low to moderate income individuals and families to be able to have the tools and resources to achieve their financial goals. Nonprofit partners such as Habitat for Humanity, which is really near and dear to my heart, 
I'm out there twice a year leading our volunteers to build homes and then going back the next year, seeing how the homes have been built and actually meeting the families who were able to go ahead and move into those homes. They even allow me the opportunity to use the chainsaw to cut some wood. And at the end of the project, I still walk away with my 10 fingers. It's an absolute delight seeing everybody work together to build the home. This crisis is something that we cannot do individually, but we have to be able to make change collaboratively. I'm really excited today to hear all of our panelists strategies and ideas on how we can work together to join forces for a positive change. Thank you, and Debbie, I will pass it back to you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Mary. Really appreciate your comments and your support. And now I'm going to turn it over uh, to Amy Danhart. And Amy, Amy has a very uh, special role uh, today because she is both the moderator um, uh, of this conversation, but also she deeply knows uh, one of the impact investing projects that will get discussed. So Amy is on the San Diego Grantmakers team. Uh, she's the director of Funders Together to End Homelessness San Diego at San Diego Grantmakers. We fiscally sponsored uh, this program. And uh, Funders Together does uh, direct grant making uh, to affect systems change, as well as housing opportunities and is playing a leadership role in advocacy to end homelessness. Uh, so uh, recognizing that housing ends homelessness, their members were leaders in creating uh, the pro one of the projects that will be discussed today called Yes in God's Backyard, uh, which is a ho affordable housing project that you'll hear more about uh, as time evolves. Uh, Amy, I'm gonna turn it over to you. Wonderful, thank you, Debbie. Um, and thank you, Mary, for hosting today. We really appreciate Bank of America's support. Um, to, give, to begin, I'd like to give everybody some context. Um, in California, there are currently, as of the last point in time count, there are 151,000 people in California who are homeless. So what does that mean? In terms of absolute numbers, California has more than half of all unsheltered homeless people in the entire country at 53% of the national total. And due to the COVID pandemic and the economic downturn that has resulted from it, economists are estimating that California could see, could very well see an astonishing 20% rise in homelessness over the next year. And as Mary and Debbie have discussed and why we're here today, um, housing that is affordable is the main solution to homelessness. We have a significant shortage of affordable housing in California. There are about 1.3 million people in California who are at or below the federal poverty rate. Yet, we only have 286,000 affordable housing units. So there's a serious gap in affordable housing. Traditional affordable housing development with, ta with tax credits is significantly underfunded. There are not enough tax credits to go around and not to mention complex with inconsistent zoning and regulations, high supply costs, and nimbyism. So despite these challenges, we, um, th we need to find more innovative solutions to increase housing production. So we're honored here today to have experts in philanthropy, impact investing, and housing development who are finding these solutions that are very innovative. First, I'd like to introduce our speakers, and then I will give each speaker a question or two and give them an opportunity to speak with you today. And at the end, we're going to have um, an opportunity for you to ask questions. So while you're thinking of questions, please go ahead and put them in the chat box now or as you think of them along the way. So first, I'd like to introduce, so first we have, um, I'll just read through the, the, the list of speakers. We have Vanita Goyal. She is a program officer for housing and transportation with the Silicon Valley Community Foundation. We also have with us today Peter Cohen, co-director for the Council of Community Housing Organizations. We have James Cutler, senior investment officer of the Silicon Valley Community oh. Foundation. We're also joined by Ruby Bolaria Schifrin. She is the housing affordability director with the Chan Zuckerberg Initiative. <clears throat> and from Southern California, we have Andy Ballister, co-founder of GoFundMe, and he also has 
he and his wife have the Be Bequest Foundation, and he's an early investor in the Yigi project. And we have Sarah Brennan, Senior Vice President for Southern California for the Self-Help Credit Union. So thank you to all of these experts for being here today. We really appreciate you being here. So let's get started. For the first 10 minutes, we're gonna hear from Benita, Peter, and James about Silicon Valley Community Foundation's work in affordable housing and issues to consider, including gentrification and displacement and the journey they've taken with their um, in impact investing to support these projects. So we'll start with Benita. Benita, could you please tell us the most compelling emerging trends in affordable housing, including your work with the lab? Thanks, uh, Amy, uh, and thanks everyone for joining. Good morning. Benita Gold with Silicon Valley Community Foundation. I can talk about three trends that I'm seeing visible right now, and then also share a little bit about how SVCF's Preservation Lab intersects with some of these. So first, um, these past few months of the pandemic crisis and the civic unrest that we're seeing right now, it has laid bare on the racial injustices that our society has come to depend on. And what experts like Ruth Gilmore are talking about, something like racial capitalism, where our economic um, systems continue to depend on a racial hierarchy of sorts, which in itself is dependent on inequality. And how that has played out in our region is this idea of uh, exclusions and dispossessions that certain racial groups have experienced in the region, and they continue to do so in the form of displacement. So in such a context, we see the emergence of a generative economy, uh, which is based on the ideas of beneficial rather than harmful outcomes, ideas of fair society, sustainable ecology. That brings me to the second point, that what this generative economy is giving us, and there's a question in the chat box around that, are models of alternative housing like community land trusts and cooperatives that are giving um, low-income communities and communities of color access to affordable home ownership opportunities. Um, and you know, um, we know that that gap between um, home ownership for African Americans and Latinx families with their uh, white peers is increasing. And so these models take out speculative housing and uh, built on ideas of shared equity really advance um, community welfare and well-being. And these models are not new. They've been with us for over half a century. I guess what is new is that potential to scale in the context that we are right now. And that brings me to my last third point that for any scale strategy, it needs to depend on a collaborative of several actors. And Mary referred to that earlier. To tackle the enormity of a problem in a larger geography like Silicon Valley, but then also to create an infrastructure that is resilient to shocks and that can be mobilized in times of crisis and after. Um, we, we saw that with the Anti-Displacement Coalition in San Mateo County leading to um, eviction moratorium ordinances when the pandemic hit in the county a couple of months ago. And this is where our work, the lab, our co-leadership of the lab comes in, where we are really developing an ecosystem of actors, of nonprofit agencies, government agencies, um, intermediaries, and uh, nonprofit developers really work in an open and uh, less hierarchical structure. Um, and um, using the lens of historic preservation that Peter will get into more, it's cultivating to mobilize on multiple levels on shifting narratives around generative economy and community wealth, wealth and well-being, on advancing policies that enable ownership of properties by mission-aligned groups, on building the core capacity of groups like several land trusts and others, and on actualizing place-based investments. And so we are doing all of this so when investments come in, we can direct them appropriately. And we have several models to rely on. We are not reinventing the wheel. I'll just end there and I'm happy to take up questions in the end. 
Okay, thank you very much, Vanita. And I think um, in, in, in order to build upon what Vanita is also talking about, we next have Peter Cohen. And Peter is doing work, um, could you please, he's doing work with the Preservation Lab as well. And Peter, could you please talk and let us know um, about affordable housing and the three Ps, production, preservation, and protection, and the work you're doing with the Preservation Lab and, and the Urban Displacement Project. Sure. Uh, thank you, Amy. Um, just want to make sure you can hear me okay. Yeah. Um, okay. Um, let me just step it back a little bit because everything Vanita said is essential to what's happening now in building capacity and, and action on the ground. Um, I think a very significant or at least broadening of the of the context in the last 10 years is important to think about for folks entering the affordable housing space. It's no longer just a question of affordable housing development and how do we get more money into that and build more projects and get more sites. What's fundamentally changed in the last decade is that there's so much urbanization and inward pressure now of migration that the broad context is gentrification and displacement as something that needs to be addressed in coming up with our housing policies. So. Uh, in a lot of our advocacy work, the framework is now housing justice. It's not just affordable housing development. It's how do you ensure housing justice, housing access, housing stability in a context where so many at-risk communities are facing these gentrification and displacement pressures. I don't know if, if someone could flash a map up on the screen. There's been some great work done by UC Berkeley's Urban Displacement Project. Um, this is specifically for the Bay Area. They've done some other work statewide. Um, and I know a lot of you folks are South, Southern California based, but you can see just simply what this does is kind of a, a, a range, if you will, of risk that communities face of gentrification and displacement pressure. These are typically low income and communities of color. And you can see the purples, the darker the purples, the more intense and at risk of those sort of displacement pressures there are. The lighter colors and the more orange colors are where there's more stability. This correlates almost perfectly with low income and communities of color and even more importantly from a, from a typology standpoint core urban neighborhoods we're starting to see the gentrification you know kind of flipping these older working class and low income neighborhoods to kind of hip spots that's our problem statement and i think this map really paints a nice picture so in other words it makes a much more complex and more systemic problem analysis that we are facing today rather than just how do we build the next affordable housing project but that also i think for investors gives us a great opportunity for more complexity and sophistication of solutions and to your question amy about the three p's what's evolved over the last three four years then is this kind of you know this intellectual construct about how do we address this complex landscape we can't just build our way out of it so we need to have multiple strategies you know a, a more complex toolkit to use that metaphor and so the three P's has now been developed. This may be old news to some of you, but we wanna make sure we're all kind of using the same language. The first P is the more traditional one, which is production. We often think of affordable housing as just another real estate production thing, but it's got a very specific intended target audience. That's tried and true. The second P though is preservation. How do we actually preserve existing housing that may be at risk of um, evicting tenants or being flipped in the real estate market? How do we get that off of the speculation market? That's the preservation P. It also has a sub variant of preserving existing affordable housing that might be losing some of its deed restrictions. It's a little bit more of an esoteric version, but primarily it's about how do you stabilize existing housing from the spec market? And the third P is, is protection of existing residents. This has traditionally been renters, so how do you keep renters in place from being evicted or other kinds of predatory actions that might um, destabilize their housing, but also low-income homeowners. We saw in the last Great Recession, you know, huge uh, throughout California, thousands of low-income homeowners lost their homes. So it's generally speaking, protecting residents in place who are at risk of losing their homes. And I don't know if there's a possibility to flash another piece up here on the screen, um, but we've been involved, our organization, as have many organizations across the state, including San Diego area, in a statewide effort in the context of COVID-19 to make an argument to the governor and the legislative leadership that we need to have investments to stabilize existing homes that might suddenly be at risk because of the economic fallout from COVID-19. And this is just the letter that was submitted about a month ago 
that basically says, look, we need money, but we also need a statewide right to purchase. We need to allow nonprofits and local governments to purchase property that's distressed and at risk. So it's just an example of how we approach the preservation P, uh, and that ties very much to the work that the lab is doing that Benita talked about. And my last point here is about scale. I think it's important, scale matters a lot. I, I think there's been a tendency, I've been in this field for about 15 plus years, there's a tendency lately to think that bigger is better. So let's do regional, let's do state. The reality is that investments really are most effective when they happen at ground level in local place-based strategies. There's organizing opportunity, there's capacity building opportunity, there's, there's ownership and buy-in in, in a literal way, but also in a kind of psychological way. So it's important to see what's happening at the ground level in very specific places and who's doing actionable policy, not just sort of write, rewriting the same script, but actually moving a policy agenda. That's what I would suggest your investors be looking for, those organizations. That doesn't mean you can't scale up. I think we can very strategically think about scaling up from the local to the regional to the state, but I really would argue that it needs to start with place-based local action and local players and then help them network themselves into scaling up as opposed to just pouring money in at the top. And I think I'll end there. I mean, there's a lot of things I can take in the questions, but I wanted to put that together. And we're very proud of working with the Silicon Valley Foundation to help build this lab because it's incubating a lot of great ideas that touch on these things that um, I just mentioned. Wonderful, thank you, Peter. And I'm wondering for both Benita and Peter, um, do you think that the social movements we are experiencing now uh, will have a meaning in, meaningful impact on housing policy? Absolutely, I don't know, Vinita, do you wanna go first or I've got a couple of thoughts too? Uh, go ahead, I can, I can add later. Well, I, I think one of the exciting things that's happening, it's, it's, it's both in the preservation P space, uh, but also in general across the affordable housing spectrum. Um, there's a, sort of a rethinking about who is doing the work. Uh, for a long time, it was sort of taken for granted that our affordable housing sector, our traditional community development corporations, were the turnkey kind of entities. But there's been a new conversation about how to make sure that there's continually capacity being developed at the community level and moving up and building capacity from the ground, not just relying upon a established industry. And so that's created a really fascinating set of conversations, uh, which I would call in sort of the social housing movement. Land trusts, really hot right now. There's a lot of talk about it. There's a lot of learning to do on the real estate side, but it's really energized a lot of organizing folks. That in turn is connected with the great organizing around people of color, recognizing that we have to continually have a dynamic capacity building if we're gonna really elevate leadership from communities of color. And then there's also connects to things about public banks. So really, how do we reimagine our sources of financing so that we can be more creative with our solutions and not always be constrained by the light, you know, the tax credit program. So there's some really interesting threads of social activism that I think are, are great to harness at this time. The only thing I would add to that is the, this idea of the movement where it is not just you know, advocacy organizations who are working on it, but they're really connecting with the community and ultimately models like land trusts and cooperatives create that, that idea, that sense of collective governance. So it touches movement at the grassroots level, not just organizers, but residents who are actually living in these communities. Yeah. And that is, that is the strength that movements bring with them as, as we've seen recently in some of the ordinances that have got passed is because uh, organizers were able to mobilize some of these grassroots um, uh, communities to advance policy efforts. Yeah. Thank you. And, and I'd like to ask James to um, also add to this conversation. James, as a, a finance expert, can you, can you give us um, an investment perspective on where you see the work Benita and Peter and Preservation Lab and Preservation? Where do you see opportunities for impact investing in this space? Hi everyone, thanks Amy. Um, the greatest benefit that Peter and Benita are allowing our team is opportunity. And an opportunity to put impact in impact investing. And for a very long time, impact investing was a checkbox. 
we in finance with our traditional risk and return metrics, and then we had a checkbox. This is social. This is green. This is sustainable. This is any key word you want to put. But we didn't really have any metrics or ideas of, of what does that mean on, on the ground? What is that doing to our community? And so what the work Peter and Benita are doing in the lab is allowing my team to say, what is the actual impact that our investments are going to have on the community? And flipping the script and saying, you tell us from the ground level, from the grassroots level, where is the capital gap? What money do you need? How can our capital as a community foundation be catalytic and have the impact we want to have on our community? You know, my time at SBCF, I've been here about six months uh, previously in CDFIs and other community development work. And the amount of, you know, offer sheets and term sheets, investment opportunities that have crossed my desk are, are quite a lot. And they're generally, again, checkboxes. Here's the risk, here's the return, here's the years, here's the all these very financial technical terms in one paragraph. And we are green, we are social, we, we are building new housing. And so the question comes to, well, what is the impact of that housing? Should, if we're gonna be doing production, where should that production go? What is the impact of building a new four or five story apartment building on a corner gonna do to the neighborhood? And so what the work of the lab is allowing us to do is really shift our focus to be on impact. We still have our traditional risk and return metrics, but we also need to add that third metric of actually measuring and being intentional on our impact. And where are these projects going? And each neighborhood's gonna be different. So we are a community foundation with a very specific geographic location of San Mateo and Santa Clara County. Everybody on this call, whether you're a foundation, a community foundation, um, you know, individual, a corporation, you're gonna have your own ideas of what is your backyard, what is your neighborhood, what is the impact you wanna have, and starting to craft those ideas around an investment strategy as really being intentional on what is the impact you want to have. Um, so I'll keep it short. I know we're short on time. So that is what I'll go into. I won't go into the, the in-depth of finance. Um, there is one slide if we want to show it, showing some of the different tools that we use um, to how to in, in, uh, implement these things that Peter and Benita are working on, which goes all the way from pure grant making to traditional investments and a wide range of risk and return and legal structures. And so what we try and do is be as flexible as we can with our capital and say, let's identify the need on the ground and then we'll make the capital work versus traditional investing has been, this is my set return expectations. And then any impact, eh, maybe it happens, maybe it doesn't, we're going to do the best we can. So we want to flip that around and say, how can we start with the impact you want to make and then backtrack into making sure we have the financial um, risk and return metrics that we need if we are talking about a long-term investment portfolio. Wonderful, and the, the slides up there, and also these slides will be available. We'll send it out to everybody who's on this, this call today. So thank you, James. Um, we do have some questions about land trusts and others I'd like to get into, but I think I will hold that till the end of the questions. And right now I'm gonna move on to Ruby. So Ruby, can you talk a little bit about how the Chan Zuckerberg Initiative is rethinking the way we finance and deliver affordable housing? Ruby, I know you're having computer issues earlier. Is it working for you? Yeah. Yeah. Can you Hi. see? Yep. Can we can see you. Um, yeah. Before I start, like picking my nose or something. Um, I. Um, so yeah. One thing I just wanted to start off before getting kind of more into the details of of how we're approaching uh, affordable housing investments is we've been thinking a lot. I've been personally been thinking a lot about how our role in impact investing. Um, is contributing to perpetuating racism and anti-blackness, right? So the, the decisions that we make to choose who to invest in and which entrepreneurs to lift up has a direct impact in influencing the future of that industry. Um, and, you know, you can look at the data and especially Black-owned, women-owned businesses, um, but Black and Brown in general, um, are underfunded and can't get access to really any source of capital let alone equity, which is a lot of times what we need, especially in affordable housing. Um, and so it's, to, it's a pervasive, persistent problem. And if we're ever gonna get over racism and particularly anti-blackness, we need to be rethinking risk and how we evaluate these projects. So I think risk in some ways has become coded words for exclusion. Um, and a lot of what I've, even in the social impact world, right, where everyone is 
very much on the same page about empowerment and eradicating racism and you know lifting up good ideas and, and all of this stuff there's so much implicit bias and it's really challenging to look at you know internally and think about how are how are my processes perpetuating this and in what ways am i not being explicit and that comes up a lot like i'll even just give examples for some of our work um you know we partnered with the turner center at uc berkeley to house um, the housing lab which is carol galante runs that and she is a deep deep expert in the space um, from her time both at HUD in the public sector and then also in the private sector working for Bridge and other affordable housing developers. Um, and so the problem that she identified was, you know, there's a lack of innovation in housing, partly because it's highly regulated, it's highly complex, and it's, it's very multifaceted, right? You could be an expert in one area and then want to solve some, but it's connected to so many things that coming up with the solutions can be really tough. So. So she saw her role potentially in playing a bridge in that. And so we fund, we helped with other, some other funders um, start an incubator called the Housing Lab, which the idea is to incubate new ideas um, to help lower housing costs. So the main goal here is how are you lowering housing costs? It didn't have to be affordable, it could be market rate too, but you had to pass on that benefit to people basically, instead of contractors or developers or things. Um, and one of the things that I found most interesting in that we had a super diverse cohort, um, you know, applicants, over 50% of the applicants were female or BIPOC um, owned businesses. So we, we spent a lot of time thinking about recruitment on that. Um, Cause I'm sure a lot of people here are familiar with kind of the myths of it being a pipeline issue. And so, um, so we really focused on that. And then it was striking to me during the pitches, um, how the white owned businesses, spoke the language of capital, right? Mm -hmm. Like there is an unwritten language when it comes to how to raise money and nobody teaches it to you, um, but white people seem to know it. And so there's something intrinsic in how we are investing that is perpetuating this. So I, I'm, I'm thinking about that myself, I know, and all of the people here, you guys have such a sense of agency, right? In actually impacting this. Um, and so I think that it really just, um, it's just important uh, and especially in affordable housing, um, since, you know, when you look at the numbers there too, of the folks who are building it versus the folks who are living in it and, you know, all of the discrepancies there. So, um, but yeah, so the housing lab, so sorry to get on a little tangent, but <laughs> I think it's important. And the housing lab was one example of kind of how it felt visceral and, and how it became real for me. And then, um, and that's a, the cohort just there. So you guys know, is kind of a mix of ADU providers, um, there's another company that's working on increasing credit scores for low-income renters. Another one focused on increasing homeownership opportunities for black and brown families. Um, so a lot of really interesting, cool ideas that I would encourage folks to check out. And we're going to continue to support that work. And again, the idea is that it's kind of like a social impact um, incubator or accelerator. And so they do this program for six months and then come out um, pitching to investors uh, to invest in their company. Uh, some other things that we've done too in the space um, is the partnership for the base future. I think that's our biggest investment. Um, we so what it is basically is um, an investment and policy fund. Um, the investment fund is managed by LISC, a national CDFI, uh, and we have we seeded it with 50 million first loss capital, and that um, 50 million first loss capital is really what de-risked the fund and was the truly innovative piece right and it's funny we use the word innovation but um i you know don't know who says it but the quote of like there's no new good ideas and all new ones are bad or something and i messed up the quote but basically <laughs> we we actually know a lot of the solutions it's more about the political and public will to solve them and and for investors to be a bit more risk embracing frankly um but so the 50 million first loss equity helped to de-risk this pool, which we raised 500 million. Um, and so we were able to leverage that. So that's a really important thing too, is when you're thinking in affordable housing, um, impact and leverage sometimes can be a little bit opposed, right? So like when you look at some of the other investments that some of the tech companies have made, they might be great in terms of, like for example, Apple was really generous and I think um, did like 150 million to the housing trust Silicon Valley. And that was pure equity or 0% or loan capital, which is awesome. 
um, but they're not able to leverage that to raise any additional funds on top of it. It's a, it's a sole fund. When that's money done, it's done. And so we were going more for leverage. Um, and the fund um, is has five initial, sorry, six initial products ranging from permanent supportive housing all the way up to uh, missing middle, which we determine is up to 150% AMI. Um, and 80% of the housing produced from this fund has to be below 80% AMI. So there's a lot of thresholds here. And by AMI, we're talking about area median income. I'm not sure um, you know, how steeped everybody is on the call, but um, that's you know, a pretty good marker for affordable housing. And um, it's for the five county Bay Area. Some other investors that have come in are Genentech, Facebook, San Francisco Foundation, um, Stupski, Kaiser. Um, so it's a really cross sector collaboration, which is what we really wanted to focus on. Mm -hmm. And San Francisco Foundation manages the policy fund. So the policy fund is grant money awarded jurisdictions to implement um, one of the three P-type policies, right? Production, preservation, and production. So um, it's a unique fund in terms of mixing um, the kind of private market capital side with the policy change side, because we need both. You can't just do one or the other. And then the other thing I would just highlight, I know I'm probably talking too much, um, is we're also you know, very um, invested with community land trusts, um, shared equity models, so Landed is an example of this, where they help with down payments for teachers to buy homes. Um, and then we're also uh, looking more into ADUs and how we can help with removing the financial barriers through um, guarantees. So we did our first guarantee with the Kresge Foundation last year. They have a guarantee pool where basically, again, when we're talking about kind of risk and credit, CZI is using our bankroll to be the credit enhancement for a CDFI. Mm -hmm. And then that CDFI can use that guarantee to do a range of investments. Right. Doing, doing project by project deals is insane. Um, it, is, it is part of the problem with how we build affordable housing. Um, and Litec has been great. You know, it's, it, it's, it accounts for over 90% of the affordable housing produced today. Um, mm -hmm. But it's become this really complex complex system. So what we're trying to think about too is what are some alternatives to help build low-income housing um, that, that could be a little bit more streamlined and easier. And so thinking about investing at an enterprise level um, is a major one that actually comes from Europe. So the UK does this. They finance affordable housing through investing in a company and then the company builds whatever um, as opposed to underwriting on a project by project level. So, um, so Ruby, there. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. Um, no, I'm really struck by what you're talking about in terms of how I wrote down exactly what rethinking risk and how we evaluate projects and also the loan guarantees and loan loss reserves. And we're going to hear from Sarah Brennan in a minute about how self-help credit union is also do that, doing that work. So it's incredibly important, like you said, to de-risk and especially when it comes to, um, um, communities of color, faith-based communities, and others. So let me transition now to hear about a project where in Southern California working with faith-based communities and their land. And I'd like to um, move on to talk to Andy Ballister. So Andy, as a funder with the Family Foundation, can you please tell us about your journey to becoming an impact investor? And then more specifically about your early investment and um, support and helping to create the Yes in God's Backyard Yigdi project. Sure. Um, <clears throat> I've lived and worked in the downtown region of San Diego for about 17 years, and I've watched our housing crisis get worse. Uh, after leaving the day-to-day -day at GoFundMe, um, I wanted to learn how to address this inequity in housing. And three years ago, I found Funders Together to End Homelessness uh, housed at San Diego grant makers. Um, I learned a lot there about the systemic issues. We have in equity data policy and the finance of housing. And we've had great opportunities to fund uh, really systemically changing uh, projects in equity data uh, services and policy in homelessness in our local region. But we have very few opportunities to uh, increase the supply of housing. And, and we know this is a hard problem to solve and um, at its base is the land cost that we have here in San Diego. Two of our members found out that 
there are 1,100 parcels of faith-based land uh, in San Diego County. And we wanted to know, would they want to develop housing? And if so, uh, you know, why, why isn't that being done? Because those parcels are largely undeveloped. And so we canvassed 60 faith organizations locally, and here's what we found. They want to help their local community, but they don't have the necessary ingredients to make housing happen. And um, that includes they have low access to capital, um, as well as a lack of expertise in development. Um, and after that realization, we thought there could be a methodology we could put in place of how to help them build housing at scale through a myriad of, of local um, you know, smaller housing projects. We found, uh, oh, we brought together an advisory board of two dozen experts who have donated hundreds of hours of work over the last year and a half. And we found a great partner in our fiscal sponsor, San Diego Grantmakers. Um, and we iterated, we found a model um, for this type of development that we call Yigby or Yes in God's Backyard. And here, here's what we've been working on. So uh, the faith community partner puts in the land they own the land and they continue to own the land throughout the construction um, as well as after. Uh, we identify fast, low cost, quality construction plans. In our first project, we're planning to use modular housing. This is housing made and permitted in a factory because of the way we can parallelize the permitting and construction. This takes, you know, traditional three to five year process down to about a one year process. We work with the faith community partner to identify the population that they want to serve. Uh, in this first project, uh, they want to serve unsheltered veterans. Um, and so after that, we can work with them to identify an operating plan. The rent needs to pay for mortgage and operation. Um, and we bring philanthropic dollars in to start that process. Uh, the upfront cost to the faith community partner is, is zero. Um, and that helps uh, alleviate, um, you know, uh, risk concerns as well as uh, there's an aversion to taking on debt in these communities. So we, we wanted to uh, figure out a way um, that we can work with them on that. Next, we bring in a lending partner alongside Impact invent Investors. Uh, Self-Help Credit Union has been a really critical partner for this solution. They've been helping us to co-innovate on a model that works here. And they also have expertise in faith-based lending, um, which is pretty rare. Um, so that's been awesome. Uh, we build quickly and we start providing housing. Now that faith community owns the land, they own the improvement, and then they own the mortgage as well. The mortgage stays the same. The rent, um, as we know, goes up over time. Uh, this provides an additional revenue stream for the faith community partner to use for services in the community. And um, that shouldn't be understated. The rent dollars will largely stay within the community, provide, you know, making this a, a community wealth building tool. Um, when the mortgage is paid back, this also represents a huge improvement to the land, increasing the assets that the faith community partner has. Uh, so a, a number of people on the call have already helped and uh, helped fund this uh, first project, but we're looking for funders and experts to help us out. So um, I'd, I'd love to hear from you if you'd like to learn more. Wonderful. Thank you, Andy. Um, Sarah, so, you know, as Andy mentioned, Self-Help Credit Union is an incredible partner on the Yes in God's Backyard project. Um, you, Self-Help Credit Union has a reputation of being one of the premier CDFIs in the nation, and especially focusing on racial justice and empowering communities. And as Andy mentioned, your, um, your experience specifically with faith-based communities. So can you give us a little bit more information about your role with Yigby and why established intermediaries like Self-Help Credit Union are so important to building and scaling new models of affordable housing? Also, Sarah, I don't know if you're on mute still, but um, it was mentioned earlier, Ruby mentioned earlier about loan guarantees. I know this project has a loan loss reserve as part of de-risking it. Could you also um, touch upon the loan loss reserve and how that works and how that's an opportunity for impact investing? Absolutely. And I did prepare a couple slides, so if we can um, put those up, I can talk to, to both pieces. 
So, um, so thank you, Amy. I, I'm Sarah Brennan, and I serve as SVP of our Southern California Presence for Self Help. Uh, we are a national CDFI with over 60 branches and offices across six states. And so um, to your question, Amy, we truly view our role uh, as working alongside Yigby and SDG and all the other wonderful partners that are involved. Um, as you know, there, this is not you know, an off the shelf project that we can just kind of say like insert here. It's truly a, a, a new model of financing that we're developing in partnership with you and specifically in response to some of the needs that we're learning as we're underwriting the first borrower, the first um, faith institution that wants one of these loans. And so I think what's really important about having a partner that can go to scale is that as a financial intermediary, we have the ability to lay the path work even as we're doing you know, underwriting for project number one now for how this could really scale quickly so that assuming it's successful, we can be on track to partner with you in deploying enough capital to construct uh, over 3,000 of these units in five years. And so, um, so you can see just this slide is a little bit about who we are. You know, it's our mission statement. We've been around for 40 years. We've deployed over $9 billion nine billion dollars in financing so far um, the vast vast majority of our members and our borrowers are people of color so actually 93 percent of of our borrowers identify as people of color and so i think it's really about drawing on our experience as a lender but then as others uh, who spoke earlier in this meeting have pointed out which we fundamentally agree with is that there's no substitute for local leadership so I think what's really appealing to us and really exciting about this project truly is that this is ground up leadership that you all, and to what Andy just spoke to, he and all the other individuals that have been forming and laying the groundwork for Yigby over the last two years. And now we get to come alongside as a financing partner and use you know, the 40 years of experience we have in developing innovative financing structures and so just kind of uh, an example or two on that is that we were one of the first CDFIs in the United States um, before the term was even you know, popularized. And we also, for example, were one of the first, if not, I think it's arguable, there's a couple others um, that may be trying to stake this claim as well, but we were certainly one of the very first financial institutions in the country to actually utilize what was then brand new, the New Markets Tax Credit Program back in 2000. So we do have a history of really um, taking local models and figuring out how to scale them up. And then it's fundamental to who we are as well that we feel that those types of learnings need to be shared. So we're very active um, within the CDFI community as well as the community development credit union uh, community in order to share what we learn, including where we may fail so that others don't have to make the same mistakes. Um, so maybe we can go to the next slide and maybe just one more note a little bit about kind of the, the story of how self-help started. We actually started 40 years ago in North Carolina. Uh, our founder remains our CEO to this day. And the context at that time in North Carolina was that um, North Carolina had been a center of textile and clothing manufacturing. And as globally that shifted to Southeast Asia, there were enormous job losses as mills and factories closed down. And displaced uh, black factory workers were some of the most impacted because there simply weren't enough other employers to um, take up and allow people to find employment. And so our roots are actually primarily helping displaced black workers start their own business. So self-help started as a nonprofit. We didn't start the credit union until we'd already been around for four years. And as a 501c3 nonprofit, what we were doing was providing that technical assistance to um, displaced black workers to help them create their own employment and start businesses. And the whole reason that we realized we had to start the credit union was because of this experience of racism that Ruby and others have spoken to, the structural racism that's embedded um, within the financial services industry meant that most of the early people we were trying to help couldn't get financing. 
So basically we started self-help in order to help those borrowers that we were already working with. And we started with $77 that was raised in a bake sale. And mm -hmm. you know, today we've, we've grown um, and continue to grow. And, and so we're, uh, this social justice mission that's really at the heart of this call is just very near and dear to our hearts and is, is what we've lived and breathed these, these last 40 years. So just to go a little bit more to um, the talk about scalability and how uh, we as a partner can play a role in that, I couldn't agree more with uh, when Ruby, I think she called it insane, to consider affordable housing solutions on a project by project basis. And I think uh, Yigby and we're all in agreement that yes, that's, that's why the scale piece of this is really crucial. And so for us, it's really about establishing a model where we can leverage um, deposits and also leverage that loan loss reserve fund that you mentioned, Amy, in order to supo support multiple projects at once. And then also assuming all goes well, that can just continue to be recycled indefinitely to support more and more projects. So that's our, that's our thinking on that. And I'm hoping I didn't go over my three minutes. I'll, I'll pause there and let me know if I do have more time, but I'll pause there. Thank you, Sarah. And I, I think we'll, in some questions, we may be able to tease that out a little bit more, but let me get, we do have a few, several questions and we are getting close to our time. So let me start with, we have our first question is about the community land trust. So I think I'll start with James in, try, in helping to answer this question for us, and others could maybe raise your hand if you want to chime in. So what is the history of community land trust in San Diego? Well, James, you wouldn't know San Diego, but maybe in general in California and their success. Um, given the high cost of properties, is there an appetite from statewide philanthropy for rapid land acquisition for a land trust model? So a couple of you have mentioned land trust. I'm wondering if we can start with you, James. Yes, I'll let, uh, maybe Benita can follow me. She has um, some a little more technical expertise on the land trust than I do. But from an investment perspective, uh, what we run into with land trust is a very uh, neighborhood, regional specific um, questions. So in Silicon Valley area, each county or each city might have different incentives that you know help provide the financing for the land trust. Um, each bank or lending institution has different regulations on whether they will lend to either the land trust itself as a nonprofit corporation or to the homeowner. You know, a lot of financial institutions won't lend to a homeowner on a land trust. That's just a whole set of policies and procedures that a, a lending institution needs to develop to say, well, if I do a mortgage, you don't own the land, right? So there are some financial institutions who have gone through this process and have products available, but many of them don't. So what we find in scaling land trust model is really um, a community by community, neighborhood by neighborhood approach. And most land trusts that you see will be focused on a specific uh, neighborhood or, or region. And so there, as far as I've seen that, um, as the question said, um, an, um, an uh, opportunity for statewide scale, I think you know, there could be potentially some policy changes um, you know, some fi financing mechanism put in place by, you know, foundations and lenders such as self-help would be very helpful in, in growing the um, land trust model. I think it's a model that is, has benefits, um, has the, many of the right tools in place, but it's not yet ready to be fully scaled statewide. And that's some of the work that the lab um, that Peter and Benita have talked about we're working on is really understanding what are the different models available to us and what they look like in each community and how can we um, pilot them, grow them, and scale them. Thank you. And also in the interest of time, maybe what we'd like to do, I, I propose that we send these questions out to our speakers and see if they could comment and then we could respond via email to um, these questions after the call. Thank you, James. Um, I'd, I'd like to move on now to talk, take another question. Um, I'm just going to read it verbatim. As a black woman and recent first time first generation homeowner of a duplex, the eviction moratorium in Los Angeles is impacting me greatly. What initiatives and or legislation are there for homeowners at risk of losing their investment and as a result adding to this, the displacement of tenants of color? Um, I wonder if maybe that's a question for Peter. Anybody else would like to jump in on that? I, 
don't really know Los Angeles well enough, so I feel a little bit out of my my sphere. Are there other um, in the, that you know of in the Bay Area? The examples, policy, et cetera, or or investment opportunities. Um, I can't think of anything really specific. Um, I think one of the one of the things that has come up in this recent um, kind of COVID response is a really important tension point um, about making sure that we're trying to figure out a both and um, in the traditional kind of landlord uh, tenant dynamic. There has been this idea that we have to protect tenants first and that um, we should be in all cases trying to get um, rental property off of the private speculation market because that's kind of the general framework of understanding in a very simplistic tenant landlord dynamic. But it's really un important to understand that there are a lot of small quote mom and pop rental property owners, particularly in communities of color. These are kind of older generations and this has been one of their income sources. So trying to figure out how to parse that out separating, if you will, you know, the Veritas and Blackstone and the big institutional investors from the small mom and pops and being able to shore up the smaller mom and pops with, of course, expectations of responsible landlording and, and you know, doing the right thing as a landlord, separating that and supporting that, frankly, um, particularly because it's addressing usually often communities of color where there's some wealth building and then simultaneously sort of pulling rental properties out of the speculation market, institutional investors, is really hard to sift. It's also hard to do policy that can actually do two things simultaneously. But it's raised some really great conversations in the movement work and in policy circles. I know this is not a direct question to the, to the asker, but I think you're right on top of something. It's really important for us as a movement to be really sophisticated. And if I can, if I can, Amy, just jump in. I think you know there's a talk about um, cancellation of rent, but um, that is also accompanied with this idea that something that Peter just referred to: the small-time uh, landowners uh, or landlords could also be um, uh, their mortgages could also be for for forbidden, mm -hmm. uh, so that um, so that that impact does not happen to them and you know that there's a bill uh, in the congress um, omar is leading that and so there are a lot of conversation about who can benefit from uh, from a rent cancellation and making sure that uh, small time landlords uh, do not get impacted uh, inadvertently from something like that mm -hmm. great yeah. Thank you. Thank you all. Unfortunately, we are up against time. I wish we had another hour. We, I really appreciate the conversation here and there's so much um, meaty, important work that's happening. So, so I'd like to thank Bank of America, Mary Knorr, and, and I'd like to thank our panel of experts, um, Vanita Goyal, Peter Cohen, James Cutler, Ruby Bellaria Schifrin, Andy Ballister, and Sarah Brennan. And thank you all of, all of you for joining us today on this call. Um, if you could please take a minute to complete your evaluation. We really appreciate your feedback. Uh, so thank you, everybody, and have a wonderful afternoon. <laughs>